Josh, I never would have thought, what, four years ago when you moved in down the street and you were like that nice guy, that nice single guy, and I was thinking, who could I set him up with? That was the only thing on my mind. <laughs> and that four years later, here we would be. So um, isn't that great? <laughs> uh, so the subject of this morning's talk, obviously, is empathy. Um, empathy, we define it, it's the ability uh, to understand and share, and share the feelings of other people. So abilities and capabilities are wonderful things, but as creative people, we also know that abilities and capabilities, they make no impact without action, right? So I don't know if you're familiar with the saying, Steve Jobs had said, real artists ship. What he meant by that was that real artists deliver. They turn their abilities into results for other people to enjoy. So that's how I want to talk about empathy this morning. Not as, about, not, about, um, not as an ability, or maybe not even as a possibility, but I want to talk about empathy with impact, and empathy that has results. And I want to do that by telling you a few stories about what empathy in action looks like and when it really makes a difference, which means that what I want to talk about is listening. Because listening, real, deliberate listening, is the bedrock of empathy. Uh, so I'll start with a story. Uh, six years ago, um, I wrote a story for the Daily News about a woman named Teresa, whose only child had been murdered. Uh, he was working as a parking lot attendant downtown when he was shot and killed during a robbery. Um, Teresa told me how after her son died, you know, her only child, she still had all of this maternal love to give, but she had no one to give it to anymore. And she told me, she said, I didn't know if I was still a mother. And that just broke my heart. You know, the idea that someone could wonder if they were still a mother if they no longer had a child. And she told me that she had joined big brothers and big sisters. And she was now mentoring a little girl whose mother was no longer in her life. And it gave her a way to still be a mother. And I found her story incredibly moving. So I wrote about it for the Daily News. We put it on the cover. And uh, we got tremendous reaction. People read it and just felt so moved by her and by her story. Um, but then there was another call, and it was a message from a woman whose voice was dripping with contempt. And she said, my son was murdered. You didn't put him on the front page. You didn't write about my grief. How do you people decide what to put in papers anyway? I guess I didn't matter to you, and I know my son didn't matter to you. I was, I was shocked, and I was also angry. I mean, I didn't know this woman, and I didn't know her son, yet she was accusing me of purposely ignoring them. So she left her phone number, and you can bet I was gonna call her back. I was gonna tell her she was wrong. So I called her back, and she let me have it. For 10 minutes, she went on, she said things that were really cruel, you know? She said I was, uh, I was snob, I was insensitive, I was ignorant, I was arrogant. Each accusation, she said, it was worse than the last one. But as she spoke, something began to shift inside me. Her anger was so pure and it was so unfiltered that it cut right through all of my defensiveness. And I was really defensive. But she was angry enough to cut through that. And suddenly, Instead of her anger, all I could hear was her pain. Underneath all of that anger, the only thing I could hear was, my son is gone. My son is gone. So her words begin to blur. And as I'm listening to her, now I don't know what I'm going to say. All my, all my defensiveness is gone. So I, I said this silent prayer. I just said, oh, God, please give me the words. I don't know what to say here. So I took a deep breath and I said, okay, ma'am, you've said an awful lot here. And I want to get to all of it. 
But the first thing I want to say is, I am so sorry about your son. I am just so, so sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. I could feel all of the anger go right out of her. It was like this. I could feel it. And she said, well, thank you. It's so clear she wasn't expecting me to say that. And I said, can you tell me more about your son? What was he like? And she said, oh man, my son, my son was the best. She said he was sweet, he was good, he was kind, he was the favorite. Now I can't tell you everything that we talked about because we were on the phone for 45 minutes. She told me how her son had been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And I told her how there were so many murders in this city every year that we just didn't have the space or the time to write a story about every single one of them. And I said I was sorry about that too because every mother's murdered child deserves a story. By the time we hung up, we were talking like mom to mom and heart to heart. And um, I asked her if she could stay in touch. You know, I could tell she was one of those great neighborhood ladies, the kind who know where all the good stories are. You know, they know the people who lives in this house and what this one says, they're, they're, a, they're such a source for reporters. Um, but I never did hear from her again, and that's okay. Because she gave me something so much better than a story. She gave me an epiphany. And the epiphany was this. That day when I let go of being right, when I let go of the judgments I had about someone who I thought was all wrong about me, I was able to grasp instead things that were so much better. Compassion, connection, understanding. And I did it because I listened in a way that I don't usually listen when I've already made a judgment. And now that was really humbling for me to realize that that's what happened, because I always thought I was a good listener. I've been a journalist for 30 years. You've got to be a good listener to do that. I've listened to people's stories. I tell them in print. Um, I think I'm good. But that day made me wonder, wow, where else am I not a good listener, but I don't even know it? What are the things that I don't know that I don't even know? And if I could make good listening more of a deliberate act instead of something coincidental, the way it had been that day, you know, that day was like a bolt of lightning hit. Is there some way for me to not wait for a bolt of lightning, but to deliberately change the way I listen so that I can end up with connection as an end result? How might I do that? Well, what I've learned has made me um, a better wife, a better mother, a better journalist, employer, uh, employee, excuse me, a better friend. And I actually think it can change the world. So when I started to look into listening and how to be a better, more deliberate, empathic listener, um, it wasn't hard to find information. There's a whole lot out there. A lot of it's really simplistic. You know, um, look people in the eye, look at their body language, don't interrupt. And when they're done, parrot back what they just told you. Okay, so, uh, all right, so, so these are really easy things. So how come more of us don't do them, you know? And if we do them, how come they don't feel like they're enough? So then I spent a while flipping back through uh, past stories I had written about people who were just known as being wonderful listeners and who were adored because of it, you know? So you've got the boss whose employees will come in weekends to make him happy. You've got the, um, the, the school teacher, who everybody says is the best, you know. You've got the neighborhood ladies, like that woman I spoke with, who everybody calls mom. And what I found was that no matter who they were, their gender, where they came from, their demographics, all of it, what they had in common was one thing. They did not need to be right. They were actually interested in getting to know what you thought and why you thought that way, than they were in telling you what they thought about what it was you just said. And that's what separates those of us who struggle with good, deliberate, empathic listening and those who don't. We like being right. That's it. It's that simple. So I have a confession. I love being right. <laughs> And here's why, okay? Because most of life is not about right and wrong, black or white, right? It's gray. It's gray. 
Uh, we love our kids, and some days we like to ship them off to an island. You know, We want to break out and start our own company, but we don't want the stress that comes with being the one in charge. Uh, we, we want to forgive the doctor for making the understandable mistake, but we kind of want to hold it over his head for making it in the first place, right? So the gray areas are in the spaces between black and white. They're the places of wisdom, nuance, and understanding. They're the places where we learn and grow. So I have another confession. I hate learning and growing. My friends and I say that life is a series of AFCOs. Another fucking growth opportunity. <laughs> so for those of you who are married, you know that marriage is filled with AFCOs. And so is parenthood, so is being a boss, so is pretty much anything in life that's worthwhile, right? I know this. I mean, I totally know this. But I never go, yay, it's an AFCO! Because living in the gray areas is hard, right? It takes hard work. So when I'm in a situation where I'm right, like unequivocally right, like the way I felt that I was with that woman, I'm like, finally, like no need to learn, no need to grow, no need to be a grown up, right? Except that what I've learned is that the best listening happens when we suspend our right to be right, when we suspend our right to be right. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean our right to believe that our judgments are objectively true. Except that the best listening, the kind that changes us and other people, it happens when we suspend our beliefs about what's right so that we can actually hear the stuff that being right keeps us from hearing. That's where empathy comes in. You let go of being right. You hear the stuff that you couldn't hear, and suddenly you're in that other person's shoes. You're in that other situation. Now, the right to be heard is at the foundation of all human rights, OK? Entire democracies are based upon it. We vote so that our voices will be heard. We create laws only after we've held hearings to make sure that all sides have a say. And our own justice system guarantees our right to be heard if we're accused of breaking the law. So being heard is a fundamental part. You know, I'm sorry, so being heard is a fundamental human right. But guess what? Making judgments is a fundamental part of being human. Because human beings are hardwired to make judgments, right? We're constantly filtering the information that comes at us, comes at us rather, excuse me. It's how we adapt and survive in the wild, in the workplace, in the world in general, and certainly in the creative fields. You know, you are, you are hired for your judgment. You make, you use all the knowledge you have, you make quick judgments. It's how you get by, it's how you do what you do. And sometimes the worst thing we can say about someone is, he lacks judgment. So judgment, there's no shame in it. It's a good thing and we need it. Except to be good, deliberate, empathic listeners, we have to suspend our judgments. If we want to be good listeners, get along with others and really understand their points of view. So this is what I think and what I've learned, I think is making it just much harder for us to do that as a society. Sorry, social media. Now we all know social media has become the major way we communicate. We're probably all here because we heard about it through some form of social media. And on the one hand, obviously, social media connects us in ways that we've never been able to connect before. And we call this, you know, social engagement. So when it works well, when it's bringing people together like this, when it's on Facebook connecting with people we haven't seen, when it's about sharing uh, work that we've done, it's all, it's all terrific. But I actually think that social engagement has created conditions for social estrangement. Because so many of us are, are using social media and it's kind of replacing the traditional ways that we would communicate. You know, the kind where I talk and you listen and then you talk and I listen. But most of social media is not about talking, about, about talking and listening. It's about exposing ourselves in some way and about someone else judging us. You know? You say something nice on Twitter, people make it a favorite. They render a judgment, right? Do it on Facebook, they like it. I remember my daughter put a photo on Instagram and she was thrilled, it got 100 hearts. Now, no one asked her what it was about the photo that moved her to take it. They didn't ask her about the conditions. They just hearted it. 
So these mediums invite us to expose ourselves, which we do, and then they invite others to judge us, which they do. And it's not even just that they do that, but there's this unspoken expectation that we must have a judgment. Even if it's not there, we know that we always could. So judgment is always right there. And that's the condition that has been set up. So it's no wonder that on social media, most of social media, you know, we don't often see things that often require much more intimate, personal, maybe even painful conversation. My wife has left me. My boss makes fun of me. Can't stop drinking. Never told my dad I loved him. Well, no one's ever going to post that. No one's ever going to like that. And worse, you know, they might ridicule or misunderstand or even pity us because of it. Because our new paradigm of communication is expose and judge, or if it makes more sense to you, it's more like perform and critique. Either way, it's the major way that we communicate. And what's getting lost is all of our willingness to be who we are. Whoops, I don't know what happened here. Is there someone you can check? I'm so sorry. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Josh. So what's, what's being lost in all of this is our ability to be who we really are in all of our glorious, messed up human perfection. Because we fear the judgment is coming. And the judgment might cut us off from connection. Now, connection is key to human survival. You know, we've known forever now that babies who are not loved and played with and engaged with are going to wither and die. They call it a failure to thrive. Well, for the rest of us, connection is crucial for the rest of us too. And without it, we can kind of wither and die. You know, the creative parts of us, the parts that that, that require risk, that require vulnerability. If we're too afraid to put them out there because somewhere underneath it all, we know that judgment is out there, why would we do it then? We wouldn't do it. So speaking, so when, when, when we can speak out loud, like without interruption or judgment, it's like you get to hear your own heart. And when we do it alone, it's like prayer or meditation, if you're into that. But when we do it with others, it actually connects us to the world. Uh, the Quakers know this. I don't know if anyone's ever gone to a Quaker meeting. They just sit in silence until somebody is moved to speak. And even the people who don't speak are performing a really vital function. They're bearing witness silently. They're bearing witness. Um, you know, the recovery movement, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but in 12-step rooms, you know, it's quiet. People will share something. They can say something that is kind of painful for them. No one says a word. And when they're done, all they say is, thank you for sharing. No judgment. Now, great therapists also bear witness, and thank God for them. You know, there's some listening is best left to the professionals. Um, but I'm afraid that listening has become, it's gotten split into two camps. There's this expose and judge kind, which is free and ubiquitous. And then there's the therapeutic credentialed kind, which is expensive and rare. So it's as if we think that we're worthy of being heard, like really truly heard and known, only when we pay a professional who's sworn an oath not to judge us. So thankfully, between these two extremes, I think, there's this vast, open, gorgeous, and creative space where we can reclaim listening for ourselves. Now, two years ago, I was feeling pretty desperate to do just that. Um, I'd gone through a long stretch of being on the phone with people who were calling a paper, you know, wondering if I could tell their stories. And it was just kind of a dry period. They were calling, but their stories I could tell once they said them, um, they, were, they were personally meaningful to them, but I wasn't sure that it would fit into the parameters of my column, and I had to tell them. But I, I you know, I felt bad. They just spilled their guts out to me. And now I had to tell them I couldn't use their story. But a funny thing happened. Instead of being upset, they just said, oh, that's OK. It just feels so good to have someone listen to me. Thank you for listening. And I thought, wow, these people needed to call a total stranger to feel heard. And I thought, you know what I need to reboot? I need one day, just one day, where I get to sit 
and listen, deeply listen to people without feeling any responsibility to make any judgment about them whatsoever. That's what I need to reboot as a journalist. So one day, I hauled two chairs from my home into Clark Park, if, you people, if, if people know where it is in West Philly, beautiful park, where they were having an arts festival. And I plopped down my chairs, and in between them, I put a sign on an easel, and this is what it said. I will listen with compassion, without judgment, and with an open heart. So is there something you need to say? Tell me. I will listen. And I sat down and I waited. Talk about feeling vulnerable. I thought, I, I look like a fool. I had told no one, by the way, that I was going to do this. I told my husband, who's right here. I told no one else. And I said, I feel ridiculous doing this, but, I, but I'm going to do it. Well, it didn't take long. People sat down. They sat down all day long. And they started by saying, well, I'm just going to sit for a minute. Like, what is this? I'm just going to talk. And then they would get going. And they would talk. And I would listen. And then, because it felt right, I would talk. And they would listen. And their stories, our conversations were just awesome, you know? We talked about things like losing our way in youth, or in a job, or in a bad relationship, and then the thrill of finding ourselves again. Uh, we talked about knowing when it's time, you know, to leave, like a city, um, a job, a relationship, and finding the courage to do it. Uh, we talked about pride the kind that saves us, the kind that gets us in trouble. We talked about the power of kindness and faith. That day in Clark Park, it confirmed for me that we are all dying, dying to be heard and known. And we will be, and we can be, when we are deliberate about how we listen to each other. And when we create safe places and conversations where we all feel safe and free to be heard and really known. So these days, to keep my listening muscles in shape and to keep me out of that ditch that I sort of got into a few years ago, um, I've totally changed how I ride the bus to work. Now, it used to be I would get on the bus, look for a seat, preferably by an open window. I'd sit down, and I'd check Twitter all the way to the office. Now, I'm a listening ninja. <laughs> I get on that bus, and I'll look for an empty seat the best kind is when it's next to someone who looks like stone face. Like they, do, they don't want to, they want nothing to do with anyone. And I'm thinking, you're the one. <laughs> and I go and I sit down and I'll just start a conversation. And if they seem open, like I might, I might make a comment on the Eagles jersey they're wearing or the weather, something, anything just to get it going. And if they're responsive, and mo most of the time they are, we'll begin to talk and then I'll ask them questions and I'll spend my entire ride focusing entirely on them with passion, without judgment, and with an open heart. And our conversations oftentimes are as wonderful as the ones I had in Clark Park. And I got to tell you that by the time I get to work, I am often so filled with joy, you would never know I had just been riding public transit. <laughs> And that's because deliberate, empathic, wonderful listening doesn't just change the person who is listened to. It changes the listener. It reminds us that we're all connected. We're all dying to be here. We're connected. And I think as creative people, especially the kind who, you know, we all work at our desk and we sit here and oftentimes we're alone and we're going out into the ether to other people. And that's a wonderful form of community. But there's other ways that I think we really must connect. And so if we find these moments, if we create these moments, that's, that's how we can do it. And if I ever forget that lesson, the only thing I have to do is to think of one more final story for you. It's about yet another mother of yet another murdered young man. And uh, her name is Valrita. And her son was shot and killed by a 15-year-old boy. Valrita told me how she had made the conscious decision at her son's trial to listen to that boy with compassion and with empathy. And she did it not, she didn't do it for him, she did it for herself. She said, I would think of my son a hundred times a day. And every time I think of him, I think of the boy who killed him. When I think of that boy, I feel hatred. 
That means every time I think of my son, I feel hatred. I can't have that. By making the deliberate decision to listen with compassion and empathy to the young boy who took her son, Valrita got to hang on to the only thing she had left of her son, which was all the love she felt for him every time she thought of him, which was a hundred times a day. That's why I believe that deliberate listening, deliberate, compassionate, empathic listening is the kind, the kind that happens when we let go of our right to be right, when we let go of our judgments. It can change the world, not just the many worlds we live in, but the ones that live in our heart. Thank you for listening.